Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto casted Horation as a combat tool. A few angry words from Niji lead to a great many changes, Hayashisama, Naruto bowed once more. I ask you to make a bargain with me. To be with the girl he loves he makes a bet. The stakes? Only his future and his dream. Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard! Chapter 13, Battle Begins Danma just shook his head in mild disgust. Trust you to arrive late even to a war. With the sudden arrival of the legendary copy ninja the odds changed. Tamari, can you fight at all? Baki whispered. I'm sorry sensei, Tamari whispered back. But I have no chakra right now. Damn it, Baki growled and came to a swift decision. He turned to Kenkuro. We're retreating. But? He glowered at the boy. Don't question me. I said retreat. Kenkuro paled and quickly nodded. Yes sensei. Still holding his sister in his arms, they turned and fled, climbing the arena wall and then over it. Hey! Naruto shouted. He was about to go after them when Ganma threw a hand in front of him. Let them go! Ganma said. Naruto turned to look at the instructor as though he were crazy. Say what? Ganma simply nodded to the stands. Our battle is right here. If they've left the, the battle that's enough for now. We need to kill the enemy who are still attacking our people. Kakashi gave a confirming nod. He's right Naruto. We have plenty of enemies right here to deal with. He looked at Ganma. By the way, I don't see Gara anywhere. Do you know where he is right now? Ganma, Naruto, Hinata, and Shikamaru all gawked at him. Shino didn't gawk, but even he seemed surprised. What? Kakashi asked. Where the hell have you been the last 24 hours? Ganma demanded. Kakashi grinned weakly and rubbed the back of his neck. Ah, well actually Sasuke and I have camped out the last few days so we could concentrate 100% on training. Next time bring a radio or get a paper delivered. Short version, Gara murdered Lee after which an enraged guy killed Gara. Ganma told him. What? Lee and Gara are dead? What about Guy? Kakashi asked. Hospitalized, Ganma answered. Save the rest of your questions until after the fighting Kakashi. Why don't you take your students and I'll take charge of the other three? That works, Kakashi agreed and looked at the two boys. This is serious business, these guys are playing for keeps which means we have to do the same. There's only one way to deal with enemy ninja in our village, and that's kill them. Do you both understand? Got it, Sasuke said, with just a hint of eagerness. Right. Naruto answered fiercely. The memory of Lee's body in the middle of all that blood filled him with anger. The memory of Hinata's screams and the screams he was hearing now from the civilians caught in the crossfire settled things for him. We need to kill, no holding back, no mercy. Kakashi nodded his approval. Naruto seemed more serious than before. That's exactly right Naruto. Why don't you make some clones and send them into the stands? At the very least they'll provide useful diversions for the leaf means already engaged. Then you and Sasuke stay close to me. Sasuke looked over to Naruto with a smirk. I've picked up some new tricks, just try and keep up. Naru Naruto blared at him. Oh yeah? Well, I've learned some tricks too. You'll be the one trying to keep up. He ran through the familiar hand signs. Kagebushin no Jutsu. Puffs of smoke filled the arena floor all around them. Two hundred shadow clones came into being. Almost instantly they disappeared as they ran towards different sections of the stands. Everyone who was still standing there was shocked at the speed with which they moved. 
Hinata looked at the original, who was still standing there with his sensei and his teammate. Naruto Kuen, how did you do that? Naruto just grinned and rubbed HT back of his head. I told you I learned some new techniques Hinata-chan. Both Kakashi and Sasuke were staring at him and wondering just what exactly he had learned. I'm going to need to talk to Ebisu when I get the chance and find out what exactly he taught him. Kakashi thought. But that would have to wait. All right, Naruto and Sasuke follow me and stay close. As the two of them followed their sensei into battle Sasuke took a quick side long glance at Naruto. Just how had his shadow clones gotten so fast in just a month? He couldn't have gone through the same physical training Kakashi had given him. Could he? Sasuke looked away and told himself to ignore the odd feelings he was experiencing. He would never tell anyone what he was feeling at that moment thinking about Naruto. Jealousy and a little fear. She was going to die. It had all happened so fast. One minute they were cheering Hinata's victory. Then the sirens sounded. And then there were suddenly sound ninja everywhere and they were killing people. Sitting with Ino and Shuji she knew they should have acted better. They were leaf nines, even if they were caught by surprise and unarmed. But in the sudden confusion, the three of them had found thems themselves caught in a stampede. People all around her were trying desperately to get to the exits and without anyone to give her orders Sakura was simply following along. Suddenly the man and woman right in front of her screamed and staggered to the floor. Standing there now was a sound nine still holding the bloody kunai in his grip. His eyes saw through her, she wasn't an enemy ninja or even a person, just a target. He was a living scythe cutting down the wheat and all she was to him was the next stalk. Time seemed to slow down as she saw him pull his hand back and then forward to slice open her throat. She froze. In that instant before death, she was powerless to do anything at all. Then there was a blur of orange right in front of her face. In the next second it penetrated that the enemy ninja was being thrown away from her. His throat cut almost clean through. She stood there shocked and numb, realizing she had gone from being dead to being saved in the space of a single heartbeat. Sakura-chan. Are you all right? It took a moment for her to recognize the blood-splattered face in front of her. Nah. Naruto? He quickly nodded. Are you all right Sakura-chan? His face and clothing had blood on them and in his right hand he held a bloody kunai. It was taking too long but the reality was sinking in. Naruto killed him, he just saved my life. And even as the thought struck her a small part of her wished it had been Sasuke. She stamped down on that thought and shook her head trying to get back to her senses. Naruto Kuen, what is going on? We're at war, he answered succinctly. Seeing Ino and Shuji also there he removed his weapons pouch and handed it over to Sakura. You three can share what I have. I'm a clone so if I get dispelled, they'll disappear too. He gave Sakura a look of such intensity that it scared her a little. Don't worry Sakura-chan I won't let you get hurt. With that he disappeared, only to reappear a few rows over killing another enemy ninja. Is that Naruto? Ino shouted. I? I? I think so. She still felt a little in shock, but she pulled out a kunai and a couple shuriken and then handed the pouch to Ino. Ino was staring open-mouthed as he seemed to teleport through the air to attack a third enemy ninja while they were still trying to figure out what to do. When did he suddenly get so amazing? Ino cried out. I don't know. Sakura answered dully. I could have died just now. She thought. I would have died, except for Naruto. Patrol 7 ran through the half-closed gates. The enemy's almost here, shut the gates. The ANBU captain shouted. The gates were shut. There were inscriptions written onto the wooden gates and well hidden for just this sort of emergency. A Chunin ran up to them and quickly read them off activating them. Triple Demon Gate Seal Immediately three huge sealed metal doors rose up out of the ground directly behind the wooden gates. 
just like that the weakest point in the wall had been transformed into the strongest. Niji, Ten Ten, and the rest of the patrol quickly ran up the side of the wall to help defend it. They were far from alone as a large force was already present. A steady stream of reinforcements kept coming in as well. The wall around Canola was 30 feet high and 15 feet thick, constructed of steel reinforced concrete. Explosive notes and jutsus could blow chunks out of it, but it would be very hard to bring down. At least without a gigantic snake or sand demon to help. And it would provide excellent cover to the defenders. On top of the wall Niji and Ten Ten stood side by side ready to begin fighting. With his Biakugan active, he calmly nodded. They are nearly here. For Niji this was almost welcomed. It was a chance to prove himself in real live combat in front of unbiased observers. Ten Ten had a small pile of various weapons out in scrolls with plenty more weapons sealed inside them ready. She looked over to her teammate. You know we just might get killed here today. Niji nodded. No doubt some of us will die here on this wall, and only destiny knows who or how many or how this will end. She continued to look at him. She finally decided that if she was going to die it would be with at least knowing the answer to one question. Niji. Niji, if we live would you go on a date with me? He turned and gave her a surprised look. You're asking me that now? She shrugged. I don't know if I have a later and I really want to know. He gave her a very slight smile and nodded. All right, if we both survive, I will take you on a date. Really? He again nodded. Yes, now here they come. With a furious shout the first wave of sand means leapt forward throwing a hail of kunai with explosive notes. They were met by an even heavier storm of kunai and shuriken. Outside the east wall the sound means had gathered. Orochimaru stood in his ninja gear, his kazakage disguise at last discarded. As he stood there, he could hear the pleasing sound of battle wafting in on the breeze. He had not received any reports and assumed all was going according to plan. You understand your orders? Orochimaru said calmly. Sakan nodded. Yes Lord Orochimaru, we are to remain near you but not to engage until the third Hokage arrives. Ku, ku, ku that's right. Orochimaru looked calm and certain. In his mind there was only one way this day could end, and that was with the death of his sensei and the destruction of the village. Now I think it is finally time for us to join in the fun. With his thumbnail he sliced down the tattoo on his forearm. There was a massive puff of smoke. Orochimaru found himself riding on top of a gigantic snake. A cross manda glared at the human standing on his head. Orochimaru. I have warned you to never summon me unless you have a sacrifice of at least a hundred humans prepared. Orochimaru grinned at the boss summon's wrath. Oh, but I have. I have prepared a magnificent sacrifice of thousands for you. The giant snake looked about and spotted his sound troops who were looking up nervously. You mean them? Oh no, your sacrifice is over there. He pointed to the village wall that was a few miles away. The gi giant snake hissed angrily. That is no proper sacrifice. You brought me here to do your fighting for you. Ku, ku, ku well that's true enough. Orochimaru admitted. But the fact is that there are thousands of delicious little treats for you just waiting there. I know you don't object to a little hunting and the battle will probably prove amusing. The snake eyed the village and considered it. Very well, seeing as I am already here, I will consider this a sacrifice, this time. But I warn you to have a proper sacrifice prepared the next time you summon me. Of course, Orochimaru agreed. Manda began heading for the village with the sound ninja trailing behind him. The fighting in the stadium did not last long. Without a genjutsu to eliminate the interference of the weaker leaf means the sound agents had found themselves terribly outnumbered. Many of them quickly realized they had no hope of victory and decided to do what damage they could, massacring the herd of civilians around them. 
cowardly or not some of the sound means made a point of killing as many as they could whether they were men, women, or children. And in every section throughout the arena a figure with an orange jumpsuit appeared fighting to help the leaf means protect the people. A young mother collapsed into her seat clutching her five-year-old son to her breast. There were bodies all around her and the sound ninja towered over her. She screamed knowing that she and her little boy were next. And then there was an orange blur in front of her and the sound ninja was collapsing back into the seats in front of her, three or four kunai in his chest. In his place was a young boy of twelve or so with spiky blonde hair and a leaf hitaiite. He looked over to her with concern. Are you all right? All she could do was nod. Don't worry. I'm Uzumaki Naruto and I'll protect everyone here. He seemed to disappear again. Did he say he was Naruto? The demon? An old man behind her said. The woman woman suddenly turned around to look at him. Shut up. Don't call him that when he just saved me and my son and probably everyone standing here. The old man frowned. Do you know what he is? A hero. She shouted at him. Her boy was crying and she tried to comfort him. All around her people had seen what had happened and listened to the exchange. Slowly most of them, though not all, began to nod their agreement. The fighting finally ended though not the chaos. Even with all the enemy in the stadium finally killed the crowd was still in a panic trying to get out. The only area where the ninja could meet and reorganize themselves was the arena floor. Their Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurinai were able to meet with their teams. Hinata immediately ran over to Naruto and hugged him fiercely. She had seen his clones fighting all around her. Are you all right Naruto-kun? He smiled and nodded as he returned her hug. I'm just fine Hinata-chan. How about you? I am fine. Hinata replied. Naruto? With Hinata still in his arms he turned his head a bit to look at Sakura, Ino, and Shoji. The three of them were all looking at him strangely, especially Sakura. What is it Sakura-chan? Naruto I. I want to thank you for saving me. Even though it should have been Sasuke. Again, she ruthlessly stamped down on the thought. Naruto had saved her life. Was she really so shallow as to be upset simply because he wasn't Sasuke? Behind her Ino and Shoji both nodded. You were amazing Naruto. Ino said. How did you ever get so powerful? Not used to hearing thanks or praise from Ino or Sakura he blushed a little. Oh, thanks, I just had some really wonderful training over the past month. Month. Just what sort of training? An upset Sasuke demanded. He hadn't gotten a chance to do anything. By the time they'd gotten into the stands the fighting was almost over and the three of them had failed to even find an enemy. Meanwhile he'd been forced to watch as all across the stadium Naruto's shadow clones were fighting, and now this. Sasuke was not the only one impressed. Naruto you saved Sakura's life? Kakashi asked. He did sensei, Sakura confirmed. He killed a sound nin that was right in front of me. I would have definitely died without him. I was so weak I couldn't save myself. Memories of Wave came back to her. Memories of how she had done nothing while Kakashi, Sasuke, and Naruto all risked their lives. She thought back to the forest of death. There at least she'd fought and she thought she'd done well. But had she? She had done all she could and still been overwhelmed. Ultimately, she'd been saved by Lee, Team Ten, and Sasuke. Am I really so weak that I always need saving? You've killed? Sasuke said in surprise. Naruto nodded and looked to Kakashi a little worried. I was supposed to, right? Kakashi nodded and grinned. Absolutely. I'm very proud of you Naruto. You did what you had to and it seems that you did it very well. Do you know how many your clones killed? Naruto nodded, he dismissed the clones and so had all their memories. 15. 
Sasuke stared at him. The dobe killed 15 enemy ninja in just a few minutes? Even with shadow clones that was unbelievable. Kakashi was also surprised not just by the number but by the calm way it had been delivered. Somewhere along the line the hyperactive knucklehead had grown up some and was turning into a real ninja. Hinata turned her face up and gave him a look of such pure admiration that he began blushing again. Kakashi shook his head. Naruto when all this is over, we're going to sit down and you are going to tell me everything that has happened since I saw you last. But for right now there is more work to be done. The fi fighting in here may be over but this battle isn't, I need to assign you missions. Asuma and Karinai both nodded as well. Hinata and Shino, Karinai spoke up. I want the two of you to help get as many civilians as possible to the cliff shelters. Once you get them there, you're to stay and help guard them. Shino looked at her. Given the manner in which you phrased that mission statement is it correct to presume that your presence in this endeavor is not to be expected? Karinai grinned. I'm a jonin, my place is on the front line wherever that may be. You and Hinata are not ready yet. Both Shino and Hinata nodded accepting her instructions without feeling any insult. Asuma looked at his squad. Ino and Choji, stay near Shino and Hinata and help them. All of you try to stay close to each other so you can back each other up if need be. His eyes went to his other student. Shikamaru, you're coming with me. Shikamura let out a sigh. Oh man this is going to be so troublesome. Hey! Ino shouted. Why does he get to go and not me? She demanded. Because I think he's ready and you're not. Asuma informed her. His abilities may prove extremely useful and I trust him not to take any unnecessary risks. That is so not fair sensei. Ino complained. Asuma shook his head. I'm sorry Ino, but my decision is final. We are at war now and I have to think about what is best for the village as well as for all of you. Don't think this mission is a cakewalk. There may well be more ninja inside the village. This is a real mission Ino and you'll need to approach it as one. Hearing that settled her down and she finally nodded her agreement. Kakashi looked at his three students. He especially looked at Sasuke. This is going to cause trouble later on. Naruto, how much chakra do you have left? Tons. Naruto answered. Enough to make more shadow clones? Oh yeah. He swiftly performed the jutsu and in short order another 200 smiling blondes surrounded them. Kakashi looked out at all the smiling faces and nodded. You're with me Naruto. Sasuke and Sakura, stay with the others and help them get the civilians to safety. Sakura meekly nodded. Sasuke's reaction was less accepting. What? He shouted outraged. You're taking the dobe, but not me? I'm ready for this and you know it. Kakashi shook his head. You are ready to face a dangerous opponent in the finals of the Chunin exams. Going out to fight an enemy in a battle is something else entirely. You're not ready for that Sasuke, and I refuse to put your life in unnecessary risk. But you'll take the dobe with you. Sasuke said darkly. Naruto sent his rival a triumphant smile. Hey, nobody cares if I get killed. The whole village would probably go into mourning if they lost their precious Uchiha. Sasuke glared at him. Shut up dobe. Naruto-kun, Hinata said in a small voice. You're wrong, I would care. She almost seemed on the verge of tears. He looked at her and felt suddenly ashamed at his flip words that had affected Hinata so strongly. I know that Hinata-chan, I was just kidding. You're still a baka Naruto. Sakura spoke up. I would care too, and so would a lot of others. Ino, Shikamaru, Kakashi, and everyone else began to nod. Everyone except a petulant Sasuke. Kakashi, Kakashi sighed, this would cause him a lot of grief later on. Sasuke whether you like it or not your mission is to help protect the civilians. 
As a ninja of this village, I expect you to carry out that mission to the best of your abilities. Sasuke looked rebellious, but ultimately nodded. Fine. With that the two groups split up and headed out to do their respective jobs. Chapter 14, Battle Continues Hurricane force winds struck the top of the wall, momentarily forcing the defenders to put their heads down until they could counter. 30 San Nines took advantage to try and make a rush. They flew across a couple hundred yards of open ground between the tree line and the dam wall. As they ran, they tried not to step on the bodies of their fallen comrades. It was difficult as the whole area was littered with dead Sunanin. The forces of San had already paid a heavy price and they had still not made it into Kanoha. The Leaf Nines were fighting like mad to hold them out and they had the advantage of both height and cover. As they rushed forward, they were greeted by piles of corpses along the base. One or two were Leaf Nines, all the rest were San Nin who had also tried to rush up and into Kanoha. It was the damn wall. They'd thrown hundreds of explosive tags at it along with their most powerful jutsus. They had torn out gashes and chunks in the thing. There was not an inch of it still unmarked, the wall was a mess of cracks, rough edges, and chunks of twisted steel. It looked much more like a jagged cliff rather than a man-made thing. The problem was despite everything they could throw at it the damn thing just wouldn't come down. Nowhere did it seem ready to collapse, it remained a terrible obstacle that gave their enemies every advantage. They had been told that a mighty snake summons provided to them by their ally Orochimaru would clear their way into Kanoha. But it had never come. Come. Some looked hopefully about as though it might still arrive to help them. Others assumed something had just gone wrong with the summons. And a few were already whispering that Orochimaru had betrayed them and the summons had been a lie to convince them to attack. They had also been told, originally, that Gara would be in the middle of Kanoha wrecking the place and sucking in every last leaf neen. Well, Gara was dead, and it seemed every last leaf neen was on that damn wall throwing down fire jutsus or pieces of metal with sharp edges or explosive tags. For the forces of Suna this battle was becoming a slaughter. But even if that was so, they were ninja and they had their orders. And they had the courage to at least try and follow them. Thirty ninja leapt over the pile of bodies at the base of the wall and ran up its jagged side hoping that this time they could get a foothold on the top. A pair of Suna Nin jumped up onto his part of the wall. There was not enough room along the crowded walkway for him to use the rotation technique he had developed. And he lacked the luxury of time to use the fancier and more formal moves he had. In his hands the Jukin fighting style could be beautiful and artistic but it could also be swift and brutal when needed. With his Byakugan active Niji swept forward to the wall's edge and slammed an open palm to the man's chest and pumped in enough chakra to stop his heart. He could see the look of shock and fear on the man's face as he clutched his chest and then collapsed over the side. Niji turned to his other opponent ready to deal with him. Before he even got a chance to the man opened his mouth and spat out a stream of blood before toppling down to the ground below. As he fell Niji saw the three kunai sticking out of his back. Ten Ten was at his side looking for targets without any leaf neens in the way. Way. The two of them watched as the rest of the Suna neens were quickly dealt with. A couple leaf neens died and fell off the wall. A couple more went down with, hopefully, non-lethal injuries. But after just a few minutes every last sand neen that had made it to the top was dead. Those that had not fallen over were unceremoniously tossed off to make room for the defenders. Niji looked out into the forest. The trees provided cover from regular sight but not from his. It looks like they're forming up for another try. Ten Ten shook her head in wonder and in honest admiration. Even though the bodies were piling up the sand neens refused to quit. Kami they're brave. Niji looked over to her. Kami they're stupid. A couple sentries on the eastern wall threw kunai with explosive notes. They exploded against Manda's thick skin. For all the damage they caused the ninja might as well have thrown pebbles. Manda's body slammed down and the wall crumbled beneath his weight as though made of wet sand. All about him people began screaming and running in terror for their lives. 
Seeing this Manda swooped in and began taking the sacrifices he'd been promised. Laughing Orochimaru called out to the ninja who were following in Manda's path. Stay well clear of him or you'll end up a part of his meal. Seeing the eagerness with which Manda was feeding the sound means did just that as they began to spread out into the village. I beg pardon Lord Orochimaru, Sakan said. But if you send off all your ninja won't you be leaving yourself exposed? Orochimaru looked at him with a wicked grin. I have Manda and you four, besides do you think me helpless? Never Lord Orochimaru. Orochimaru looked back into the village. He was looking at the cliff. Speci specifically, he was staring at the visage of his old teacher. Besides, he hissed. I wouldn't want it to be too hard for dear old Saratobi sensei to come and say hello. On a black and white monitor Sarutobi could see the distant image of a giant snake leveling buildings. On a few other monitors little black dots skipped across the screen and were gone. Those were individual ninja that were breaking into Kanoha, into his home. All available ninja are being sent into the eastern section of the village. Ibiki informed him. The forces on the south end are holding firm and don't seem to need any reinforcement. Good, Sarutobi nodded absently. All the plans were in place and things were running smoothly. He hardly seemed needed here. Inoichi had already left, he was going to find his old teammates and fight beside them. Inoichi felt his place was on the field of battle. Sarutobi got up out of his seat. You're doing very well Ibiki, I leave the coordination of our defenses to you. Ibiki turned in alarm as did the ANBU who were present. Are you going somewhere Hokage-sama? Sarutobi nodded. There is something I need to take care of, something I should have handled a long time ago. Let me guess, you're going to kill Orochimaru. A familiar voice spoke up. Sarutobi turned to the new arrival. That is correct Jiraiya. I had the opportunity to kill him long ago, but I allowed foolish sentimentality to stop me. All the harm that he has caused since that day is my responsibility. Today I will correct that mistake and kill him. Well, that's pretty noble of you old man. Jiraiya said. I just never thought you would abandon your duty as Hokage in order to settle a personal score. Didn't you always used to say that the Hokage's duty was to protect the village and the villagers above all else? Sarutobi frowned. That is exactly what I intend to do. Jiraiya shook his head. What you're trying to do is settle an old debt. Orochimaru needs to die. You don't have to be the one to kill him, that's what I'm here for. Your place as Hokage is here, directing the defense of the village. I believe Lord Jiraiya to be correct Hokage-sama. Ibiki put in. The proper place place for a general is in the command tent, not on the front line. The ANBU all nodded swift agreement. Above all else they wanted to keep their beloved Hokage safe. Besides, Jiraiya added. What if you were to be killed? What would happen to the village? The village is greater than any one man. Sarutobi answered firmly. Kanoha would survive. And who will lead if we lose you? Sarutobi frowned a bit. That was a damn good question. He'd been putting off the idea of finding another successor. Maybe it's about time I gave that some thought. The council would find someone, I'm sure. And in the meantime, there would be panic in the streets and a power struggle at the top. Is that what you want? It wouldn't be as bad as that, Sarutobi insisted. Well, it sure wouldn't be good. The village needs you old man. Let me and the other ninja fight for you, that's our duty. Yours is to make the decisions and make sure they're good ones. Sarutobi didn't like it. Where Orochimaru was concerned he felt a personal responsibility. But Jiraiya's argument made a distressing amount of sense. Very well, I suppose I must admit that this is my proper place. To everyone's vast relief he sat back down in his seat. Good, Jiraiya said. Now if you'll excuse me, 
I have a snake to kill. They had been heading towards the gate and the south wall when they heard and saw the east wall come tumbling down. It was sort of hard to miss a gigantic snake running amok. Immediately Kakashi and the others changed direction and headed to the new trouble spot without bothering to wait for any formal orders. It was not long before they ran into trouble. Three sound nines landed surrounding a small crowd of civilians trying to get away. Away. Their lord's orders had been clear. Kanoha would be left a smoking ruin. And it was to be left a graveyard, there were to be no survivors. The three enemy Nin were about to get to work when a shadow came out of a nearby alleyway and merged with theirs. The three Nin suddenly found themselves unable to move. They were helpless as an angry-looking leaf Nin came up to them. He took a trench knife out and very quickly and neatly dispatched them. The civilians shouted out their thanks and got running again. Asuma turned to the alley as he cleaned the blood off his weapon. Good job Shikamaru. Shikamaru came out of the shadows rubbing the front of his neck. That is really not a pleasant feeling. Asuma chuckled as he lit a fresh cigarette. Then you better not ever let your throat get slit. Now come on, let's find some more targets. A pair of sound nines were running along the rooftops when they suddenly found themselves in the middle of a thick jungle. Much worse they were sinking in quicksand. Taken by surprise and momentarily disoriented, they followed their instincts by struggling to free themselves from the quicksand. Never noticing the red-eyed woman calmly walking up to them from behind, a kunai in her hand. This was a dream and a nightmare. It was a dream because this was a chance to really show people what he could do. Naruto had lived his whole life with people telling him he was nothing, that he was worthless. He had planned to show them how wrong they were by winning the Chunin exams. But this was an even better opportunity to show people what, what he could do. The nightmare was from the fact that his village was being attacked and his people being killed. Even if most of them were mean to him they were still part of his village. Naruto turned a corner and came to a sudden stop. There in front of him were a bunch of villagers screaming and running for their lives. All along the street were bodies. He was forced to watch as a sound nine stabbed an old man in the throat. The bastard didn't even bother to watch as he fell in a bloody heap. He was heading for an old woman his kunai ready for more. He and three of his friends were slaughtering unarmed civilians. Bastards! Naruto screamed and ran forward as he began working a jutsu. He needed to protect the civilians so he needed to get the ninja away from them. He rushed to the old woman's side. Wall of wind technique. In front of him all the air suddenly solidified into a sold front. He sent the wall forward and it plowed into the four sound mean rudely shoving them back and away from the people he wanted to protect. He turned to the old woman beside him. Get out of here I'll take care of them. The woman was surprised. She knew who he was. She'd often sent the demon angry looks. It was disgusting to have the demon living among them. She hated the demon. But he had just saved her. Bless you, she said and ran. Naruto forgot about her and the other civilians as he focused on the four ninja in front of him. He quickly performed another jutsu. Air Dragon Missile Twenty feet above his head the air began to swirl and the barest outline of a twisting dragon could be seen. Unlike his previous jutsu this one was offensive in nature. He unleashed it and the four ninja all leaped back. Three of them got clear. The fourth was caught in the jaws of the dragon. The dragon snaked up into the air a bit before slamming itself and its prey into the street. When the dust cleared there was a small crater and a broken bleeding body in the middle of it. Behind him Naruto could hear a sound like birds chirping. The remaining ninja rushed forward, one towards Kakashi and two towards him. Tim. Naruto smiled. Ebisu had taught him a lethal jutsu just yesterday and forbidden him to use it in the exams. It was something to be used only against enemies of the village. Ebisu hadn't expected him to learn it one day, he had shown it to him in the expectation he would get it down after the exams. 
But just as with the Kagebushin Naruto had gotten it down in a matter of hours. When he was truly motivated to learn something the dead last of the academy could be surprising. As the two ninja closed on him he cast his jutsu. Blades of Wind Unlike the previous jutsu the two sound means never saw this one coming. Normally this jutsu acted on a single target, but Naruto had given it a lot of extra chakra and the two of them were close. They cried out as the blades tore into them, but it was all over in just a few seconds. Naruto stood there drenched in blood, he was a bit stunned. He hadn't expected it to work that well. The two ninja were both down, pieces of them scattered and their blood splashed all over the street. One had his neck almost sawed off, it was still attached by a little piece of flesh and lolling twisted and facing the ground. The other one had both arms gone and his chest torn completely opened. Naruto had seen and done a lot of killing this day, but this was just a little much. He turned his back on what he'd done and began throwing up. Kakashi pulled his hand out of his enemy's chest and let the Chidori fade out. Since this was going to long day with Kami knowing how many enemies, he was using Chidori rather than Raikiri to save Chakra. Despite his own battle he had watched as Naruto used three completely new jutsus to defeat three enemies. Kakashi just shook his head. It had taken him an entire month to help Sasuke improve his physical endurance and speed and learn one jutsu. And that was with the help of an active Sharingan. In that same time Naruto had gotten the forcing technique down, greatly improved his taijutsu, and learned three new, new jutsu. All without the help of a bloodline. He was really beginning to wonder if he'd been focusing on the wrong student. He squatted down beside a bent over Naruto. You alright? Naruto nodded and quickly wiped his mouth. Sorry sensei. There's nothing to be sorry about Naruto, considering you've never killed before today I'm very impressed. You've done an amazing job so far. Naruto grinned weakly. Thanks sensei. You ready to go or do you need some more time? Naruto stood up. I'm ready sensei, we can't stop yet. His eyes went to the spot where the giant snake was a few miles away. Kakashi nodded. Let's go then. Manda was in the middle of enjoying himself when a giant frog appeared. You. The giant snake hissed. Gamma Bunta glared and put a hand on his sword. It's time to settle some old scores. On the snake's head Orochimaru looked unhappy. Is the old man afraid? He mocked. I was hoping to settle things with him face to face. Jiraiya tossed his head back and laughed. Afraid? Of a little snakeling like you? He decided that I could deal with you without any trouble. Orochimaru shook his head. You always were a fool, Jiraiya. If you want to die today that's fine. What do you say we face each other while our summon settles their differences? Fine by me. The two of them leapt off and wound up on the roof of a nearby warehouse. Grinning Orochimaru turned back to the four ninja waiting behind him. Do it. Yes Orochimaru-sama. All four answered at once. They swiftly moved to each corner of the roof. Shishienjin Four Flames Formation. A barrier of crimson chakra formed above and around them, sealing them in. What the hell is this? Jiraiya asked. I just want to make sure we have our little reunion without being disturbed. Orochimaru took out a kunai and licked its edge. You're going to die here today. Well one of us is going to die. Jiraiya said. And Jiraiya was correct. Chapter 15, Battle Ends The two old friends and teammates faced each other. Why? Jiraiya demanded. Why come back after all this time? Orochimaru giggled. Ku, ku, ku isn't it obvious? I've come for my revenge. Revenge. I have come to pay back the wrongs done to me by Saratobi Sensei and this entire village. Wrongs done to you? Jiraiya spat. Saratobi loved you. You were always his favorite. 
Despite himself, he couldn't keep a trace of jealousy from his voice. And yet he chose another to be his successor. Jiraiya nodded. That's right, the old man went with the best choice. Orochimaru stiffened. Are you going to try and pretend that was the reason you turned on your fellow villagers? Did you murder and experiment on them out of petty jealousy? No fool, that was always bound to happen. One cannot gain knowledge without sacrifice. Had I been made Hokage, I would have experimented on prisoners and enemies. I would have changed Kanoha and made it a reflection of my own glory. Jiraiya shivered at the thought. But of course, once I realized the ingratitude of Sensei and the villagers, I decided to begin my work. Jiraiya shook his head. You killed dozens of innocent villagers and even some fellow shinobi. You betrayed the village we'd fought so hard to protect, and for what? What knowledge could be worth such a price? I'll show you. Orochimaru reached up and tore off his face. Baki, Kankoro, and Tamari finally made it to their fellow Sanin. They'd had a hard time escaping the village and been forced to kill a few leaf Nins. Crow was now carrying Tamari and gently set her down as Baki searched for Tomas. Where is the general? Baki asked. Dead. Dead, came the reply. He was killed at the very start. Why are we still outside the village? Baki demanded. What happened to the summons? Several San Nins looked at each other and shrugged. It never showed up, one of them answered. We've been trying to breach the wall ever since. Baki looked around, he estimated there were about 500 ninja. Where are the rest of our forces? They're feeding the crows out by the wall. Came the bitter reply. They're dead? To his horror all the heads bobbed up and down. Suna had always had a much smaller population than Leaf. That was why they'd been forced to rely on the quality of their ninja and been willing to do what they did to Gara. Suna only had about 1,400 ninja total as compared to about 3,000 for Kanoha. To mount this, attack the Kazakage had stripped the village of every last jonin and chunin and all the best qualified genin. A thousand of Suna's best had come here under the Kazakage's orders. And in less than an hour half of them were gone. Baki stood there in shock. This was a disaster. What does the Kazakage say? We have not seen or heard from the Kazakage since the battle began. Baki knew something was definitely wrong then. The Kazakage's place was here with his army. Who is in command then? Who is senior on the field? The men all looked at each other and then looked at him. That would be you now. What are your orders? Baki grimaced, he had never wanted command of the army. But it was his whether he wanted it or not, and he knew what had to be done. We're disengaging, he announced. We'll pull back three miles and wait for orders from the Kazakage. Baki you can't. Tamari called out. The Kazakage will have your head if you order a retreat. She's right, Kankoro agreed. Neither of them wanted to lose him. Over the years Baki had been more of a father to them than their biological one had. I am not ordering a retreat, Baki said. I am ordering a disengage disengagement. The plan was never for us to try and breach a fully man wall. If the summon should appear and clear a path for us or if the Kazakage should order it we will renew the attack. He did not mention that he did not expect either to occur. They're pulling back. Niji said. Are you sure? Ten Ten asked. Maybe they're just forming up for another attack. Niji shook his head. No, he said with certainty. All of them are going. She smiled. I guess the fighting is over. He looked over his shoulder to where a giant snake and frog were battling miles away. Here at least, I need to report this. The street was littered with bodies. Some were civilians who had been caught earlier. A handful were leaf neens. But most were sound neen. 
the invading Sound Nin were no longer facing helpless villagers. They were now going up against the full might of Kanoa's army, and they were being slaughtered. Outnumbered and without the advantage of surprise, they were simply no match. The invasion was being stopped and thrown back. The Sound Nin kept fighting, but they were no longer advancing. They were heading back towards the spot where they had entered. And in just about every sector where there was fighting Naruto could be seen. His clones not only fought they also worked to evacuate both ninja and civilian casualties. People everywhere were seeing not only his courage but his compassion for the people he was trying to protect. As the fighting raged Naruto's kills and evacuations increased as the number of surviving clones decreased. During a short lull in the fighting Kakashi, Kurinai, Asuma, and Shikamaru found themselves reunited. Naruto was there as well, bent over and panting. Hey Naruto you alright? Shikamaru asked. Naruto's energy was as legendary as his laziness. To see the blonde so spent he had to be really exhausted. He looked up and nodded wearily. I'm fine, it's just that with so many clones using so much energy it's wearing me out a little. The three senseis all looked at one another knowingly. Forcing used up a lot of chak chakra and physical stamina unless you had extraordinary control. That was the reason most ninja did not use the technique. Even with Naruto's vast reserves it was only to be expected that with so many clones using it their exhaustion would begin to mount. And as they were dispelled that weariness was beginning to tell on the original. Kakashi approached the two genin. Naruto, you've done more than enough already. I want you to stay here and rest for a while. No, he stood up straight. I'm fine, I can keep going. How many clones do you still have out there? Naruto's weary mind needed a minute. About sixty I think. Kakashi shook his head firmly. If you're this tired now then you'll be unconscious when they go. I can't let you go into battle under those circumstances. But... Kakashi put a hand on his shoulder and smiled beneath his mask. Naruto, you've already done much more than I expected or could have ever asked for. I am very proud of you. Despite his exhaustion Naruto had a big smile on his face. Thanks, Kakashi-sensei. The smile faded and Kakashi looked a lot more serious. Naruto, when all this is over, I'm going to teach you a new jutsu. Naruto looked surprised, but a little suspicious. Really? Or are you just saying that? Kakashi was a little hurt at the obvious doubt. Does he have so little faith in me? I definitely will Naruto. But for right now just stay here and rest. Asuma looked at Shikamaru. Shikamaru you stay here as well, I know you're starting to run low on chakra. Unlike Naruto Shika just gave a grateful nod and sat down on the sidewalk. Naruto watched as the three elite jonin leapt away to return to the fighting. Damn it, he muttered. Don't be so troublesome Naruto, Shikamaru said. You've already made yourself a hero today. What more do you want? Naruto, Naruto looked over in surprise. A hero? All I've been doing is my job. Shikamaru just grinned at how thick-headed his friend could be at times. How many enemy ninja have you killed? How many people have you gotten to safety? Again, Naruto needed a moment, his head seemed kind of foggy. I've killed 50 I think and gotten maybe 200 people to the hospital. Shikamaru just shook his head. You've killed 50 enemy ninja and rescued a couple hundred of our people. That sure sounds like a hero to me. Naruto gave him a weary smile. You really think so? Yeah. Well, that's good. Feeling tired he sat down and next to Shikamaru and leaned against the side of a wall. He was soon asleep and snoring. Orochimaru tore away his face to reveal the face of a young woman. Jiraiya's very first thought. Hey, Orochimaru is kind of hot. EW, EW, I did not just think that. I see, so you have come up with that jutsu? The female Orochimaru laughed. 
Indeed, I have. Are you jealous, Jiraiya? Does my genius leave you feeling inferior? Slowly and painfully, Jiraiya nodded. I will admit to being a bit jealous. Orochimaru smirked. I have always wanted to be able to turn myself into a beautiful woman without relying on a mere henge. Can you make yourself look like Tsunade? Orochimaru gaped at him. You baka. This is no transformation jutsu. His face reverted back to his original, much to Jiraiya's disappointment. I have taken possession, possession of a whole new body. This is Furofushi no Jutsu, the art of immortality. By moving on to new bodies, I have found the secret to eternal life. I will finally be able to fulfill my dream and learn every Jutsu there is. I will know everything. Jiraiya shook his head. I see, all this has been just to allow you to fulfill your selfish dream? All the pain, all the suffering you've inflicted, all just so you could become immortal, huh? Jiraiya spat in disgust. You're pathetic. A true ninja does not hide from death. He accepts it, knowing that life must end one day is what gives life its joys and pleasures. Orochimaru laughed. Well, if you think so highly of death, I won't stand in your way. Let me show you a special jutsu I was planning to show sensei. He grinned cruelly. Tell me, would you like to see your prized student again? He ran through some hand signs. Kuchio said a tensei summoning reanimation. Before him a vortex formed on the floor and out of it rose three coffins. Too late Jiraiya recognized their markings. No. Orochimaru laughed as his old teammates distress. Yes. The coffins opened and three figures shambled out of them. Jiraiya knew all three of course. Two he knew from pictures and from their faces on the cliff wall. But the other face he knew as his most precious and gifted student. Oh Minato, he grieved. All the memories, good and bad, flooded back. Minato looked at him and nodded in recognition. Hello sensei, it's good to see you again. You look older, how long has it been? Thirteen years kid, he choked out. A look of worry entered Minato's face. Naruto, how is he? How is my son? Jiraiya looked away, unable to look his beloved student in the eye. He is well, he is a genin now. Tell me about him, Minato asked eagerly. Is he happy? Do the people see him as a hero? Have you been training him? Jiraiya flinched at each question and tried to think of a way to answer. Orochimaru found the scene absolutely delicious. He'd always hated Minato, Minato as the rival who had stolen the position that was rightfully his. Ku, Ku, Ku what's the matter Jiraiya? Your prized student wants to know about his son. Aren't you going to tell him? Jiraiya looked hatefully at the man he'd once called friend. Damn you for this Orochimaru, I swear I'll take you apart for this. Orochimaru laughed. Well before you do so, please do answer your student. He has waited so very long to hear about dear little Naruto. Sensei, Minato pleaded. Tell me of my son. Jiraiya looked at his student. He is a tough, brave little kid who never quits. His mouth closed as he could think of nothing else that was safe to say. Is he happy? Minato asked. Jiraiya hesitated to answer. Orochimaru answered instead. He is miserable and all alone. The people of the village despise him and shun him as a living demon. He has been alone his entire life. He is an orphan who knows nothing of his parents and likely believes he was never wanted or loved. And as for Jiraiya? He has never even spoken to the boy, let alone trained him. That's a lie. Jiraiya snapped. I met him just a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago? Minato repeated. You abandoned my son all this time? No. Kid I swear it wasn't like that. Jiraiya tried to explain. 
I had duties outside the village. And one mission led to another and I could never get back here. I haven't been in Kanoha since just a month ago. Minato looked at him sadly. Then you really did abandon him, you left my son all alone. Jiraiya could hear the accusation and could not really deny the truth to it. He looked down ashamed. I'm sorry. Well, this has been a delightful reunion. Orochimaru approached the three Hokages and planted a kunai with an attached scroll into each of their heads. But now I have restored their abilities and I think I will have my three little puppets tear you apart. Jiraiya looked back at Orochimaru. How did you know about Naruto? You were already gone from the village before he was born and his status was, was a secret. And a well-guarded secret at that, Orochimaru agreed. I had no idea of the truth until I ran into the boy during the second stage of the exams. Only then did I realize the truth. Since then, I've had my agents gather information on him. He interests me. Minato slowly turned to face Orochimaru. How does my son interest you? He asked coldly. Orochimaru smiled. Oh, I can think of a dozen experiments I could use him for. If he survives the battle, I plan to take him with me along with one other. No, Minato held out a hand and formed a Raisingan. You will not touch him. Orochimaru shook his head playfully. Fool, the power of my jutsu binds you to my will. You must obey my every wish. Minato began to smile, his smile slowly drained away Orochimaru's good humor. Tell me Orochimaru, do you know how I was able to implant the Kyubi into my son's body? He shrugged, something that had happened so long ago was of no importance. I assume you used some seal. Minato shook his head. You never bothered to learn much about seals, did you? Seals do not interest me, only ninjutsu matters. But no ninjutsu known could have stopped the Kyubi. It was a very special seal that saved Kanoha that day. Shikithujin, the Reaper Death Seal, I called on the power of a Shinigami to transfer the Kyubi's spirit into my son. And in order to work the seal I was required to give up my life and my soul to the Shinigami. So? Orochimaru asked. Why should this interest me? Well, because what that means is that my soul is the property of the Shinigami. Which also means, he suddenly vanished in a flash of yellow. Orochimaru screamed as a Raisingan tore through his back and out the front of his chest. You don't control me. Minato finished calmly. Orochimaru stared down to see Minato's hand coming out a huge bloody hole in his chest. His mouth opened and spewed up blood and pieces of flesh. No, it can't, no. He tried to deny it as he felt his body began to shake and groan numb. Minato leaned in and whispered to him. The deepest pit in hell is reserved for betrayers. Hell awaits. Orochimaru let out a final gasp before slipping down to the roof. Thus did the Yandame Hokage kill the Sanin Orochimaru. Sakan, Tayuya, Jirobo, and Kadamaru all cried out and collapsed at that same instant dispelling the barrier. Anko was enjoying a healthy chase when she came to a sudden stop and screamed. She put both hands to a spot near her neck before collapsing. Sakura shyly approached Sasuke. They were standing outside one of the entrances to the cliff shelters. They had managed to escort a large crowd from the stadium all the way here without incident. She, Ino, and Shuji had all been relieved. Sasuke on the other hand had started brooding. His eyes were locked to where a giant snake and frog were battling. His hands were twitching and it was obvious he wanted to go where the fighting was. Sakura wasn't sure what to say to him. She had tried making conversation a couple times only to receive a clawed glare and a dismissive, HN. Just as she was about to try again, she saw the mark on his neck suddenly glow red. He grabbed at it and began howling as if he were dying. Sakura reached out and grabbed a hold of him. Sasuke Kuen. Sasuke what is it? Mercifully the screaming ended after only a few seconds and he was unconscious. 
Sakura looked at his neck and was very surprised to see the mark that had been there gone. Give up, Manda muttered even though his fangs were clamped into the frog's back. You give up, Gamabunta twisted the sword that was clean through the snake's body. Arg, Manda sounded in pain and finally disappeared. Despite his own wounds Gamabunta smiled triumphantly. I win. Then he too was gone. All around them the tide of battle had turned. The sound means were being driv driven out. The last remnant of their forces now concerned only with survival. But there was no one near the immediate vicinity in the warehouse. With Orochimaru's death all his jutsus were ended. The first and second lords Hokage turned to dust, revealing the forms of the two sound nin that had been sacrificed to bring their return. The fourth Hokage managed to hold on just a little longer. Minato turned to look at Jiraiya. My time is short sensei, in a moment I will return to the Shinigami's belly. You told me that you loved me like a son. Was that a lie sensei? No. Kid I really do love you like the son I never had. Then if you love me sensei, take care of my son. Train him and don't let him be alone anymore. His body began turning to dust. Promise me. Seeing his beloved Minato disintegrating before his eyes Jiraiya shouted. I promise. I will take care of Naruto, I swear it. With those words Minato smiled and held a final look of peace. Chapter 16, Tears from a Loved One Sarutobi was standing on the roof of the tower looking eastward. The sun was beginning to set and the fighting had come to an end. One thing was abundantly clear. Despite the destruction and tragic loss of life, his village had won a great victory today. Initial reports put the losses of his ninja at about 50 dead and twice that many wounded. By comparison Suna had lost about 500 dead and sound close to 900. The Sanin were already retreating back to Suna with what remained of their army. The sound army had been annihilated almost to the last man, it, its few survivors running for their lives. His ninja had been magnificent, they had achieved a 14 to 1 kill ratio. For every leaf Nin killed 14 enemy Nin had died. When news of this battle got out, he was sure that his village's reputation would only get stronger. The single most important thing was that the power of the army remained intact. Looking at the destruction to the eastern part of the village he was reminded that two or three thousand civilians had been killed during this tragic day. He frowned as he took a long puff of his pipe. While well, both Sound and Suna were going to regret what they had done here today, as Hokage he would make sure of that. He liked to think of himself as a fair and kind man. But he'd been Hokage through all of the Third Great Ninja War and had no trouble being hard and decisive when the security of his village was at stake. A figure materialized to his right. He turned and was on guard, a handful of enemy ninja might still be in the village. Humming a happy tune Kabuto slipped out of the village. With Orochimaru's death everything had now changed. He had absolutely no loyalty to sound now. He would need to do what was in his own best interest. Sarutobi relaxed and smiled seeing it was Jiraiya. Congratulations Jiraiya, you did a very great thing today. For the first time in a while he managed a weary smile. I hear you not only killed Orochimaru but captured all four of his bodyguards. Very impressive I must say. Jiraiya solemnly shook his head. For once he did not seem at all interested in boasting of his accomplishments. Not really that impressive, for some reason they all passed out when the bastard died. And as for killing Orochimaru I wasn't the one who did it. Hearing that Sarutobi was naturally surprised. Then who did? Briefly, briefly and succinctly, Jiraiya related the events that had taken place. Sarutobi listened carefully, his expression growing sadder with each word. Ah, Minato, Sarutobi shook his head sorrowfully. Even after his death he protected the village. Truly, he was a worthy Hokage. No, Jiraiya said. It wasn't for the village. He killed Orochimaru to protect Naruto. Jiraiya looked down dejectedly. 
Sarutobi sighed. I have had reports from dozens of different ninja about him. Every one of them praising his courage and his actions. Despite everything that was done to him he has proven a heroic and loyal ninja. He truly is his father's son. I want him for my apprentice. Jiraiya looked back up. I am going to teach that kid everything I know. When I'm done with him, he'll be every bit the ninja his father was. Saratobi nodded, after what Jiraiya had told him he was not surprised. I don't think Kakashi will be pleased. Too bad for Kakashi then, Jiraiya said flatly. Sarutobi sighed again. He will be your apprentice, but there are other things that have to be dealt with first. In an ANBU interrogation cell, the ninja formerly known as the Sound Four were heavily chained up and under the watch of a number of ANBU. Upon waking Taiyuya had started cursing them only to be slapped across the face and told to remain silent. The four of them were forced to stand there and simply wait. None of them had ever imagined that with Orochimaru-sama leading them that they could lose. In their wildest nightmares none of them had ever thought for a second that the great Orochimaru could be killed. They had all seen it of course, though none of them knew the identity of the killer. Orochimaru had not shared his intentions with any of them, and since none of them were from Kanoha they had not recognized the three faces. The barrier had blocked all sounds so they had not heard, heard a word spoken. All they knew was that Lord Orochimaru had summoned three ninja to fight for him, and somehow one of them had turned on and killed him. With his death, they had lost the power of the curse seal and passed out from the searing pain. When they had woken up they'd been here. In just one step, they'd had gone from an elite fighting force to helpless prisoners. The door to the room opened and two ninja entered. They all recognized one from his photos and his robes as the Hokage. They also recognized the other one. You, you fucking son of a bitch. Tayuya screamed at Jiraiya. An ANBU rushed over and punched her hard right in the stomach. Show the Hokage and Lord Jiraiya respect. He shouted at her as she doubled over. There is no need for that. The Hokage said calmly. He slowly and deliberately lit his pipe and took a couple puffs as the prisoners eyed him nervously. He took the pipe back out and continued. I will make this quick. Having come to this village with the sole purpose of doing harm I hereby sentence you all to death. He turned to one of the ANBU. Take them up to the courtyard and execute them. Hi Hokage-sama. With that the Hokage turned to go. Wait. Sakan shouted. You can't do this. The Hokage turned back and eyed him curiously. And why not? We're helpless prisoners. Jiraiya snorted a laugh. So? You came here to attack us kid. Do you think if you were caught in Suna or IWA or Kumo any of them would do anything different? For that matter what would Orochimaru have done with prisoners? The four of them all looked at one another with real fear in their eyes. Lord Hokage, Jirobo bowed as low as his girth allowed. I had always heard that you were a man of honor. Would an honorable man kill prisoners? I did so in the Third Great Ninja War. Sarutobi replied easily. Every ninja understands that if he is captured, he is at the mercy of his captors. Captors. Every ninja also knows that if he is taken within an enemy village, that by itself, is sufficient cause for a death sentence. Count yourselves lucky that I am honorable. You will not be tortured or used for experiments. You will each be given a quick clean beheading. Jiraiya grinned at their obvious fear. What did you think? That you could come here, destroy our homes, kill our people and just walk away? Were you expecting a kiss on the cheek? We'll serve you. Kadamaru said. We're all powerful ninja and we could be a benefit to you. Sakan quickly nodded. We'll do anything you want and serve you faithfully. Saratobi paused and seemed to consider it. I would never be able to trust you. You would run at the first opportunity. You could put tracking seals on us so we wouldn't be able to escape. 
Sakan offered. Jiraiya frowned at that. Well, I could put some tracking seals on them that only a seal master could hope to remove. Since there aren't too many of us around, they really wouldn't be able to escape. The four of them suddenly looked hopeful. They all eyed Sarutobi as he puffed on his pipe again. Why bother? Sarutobi asked. These children were captured without even a fight, no doubt they are weak and not worth such trouble. Lord Hokage, Jirobo spoke with careful and measured tones. We were captured so easily only because of the extraordinary pain caused by losing our curse seals. Sukan nodded. We were trained by Lord Orochimaru himself and are very skilled not only in combat but in creating barriers and defenses. Orochimaru-sama would never have allowed weak ninja to act as his bodyguard. Just take us somewhere and allow us to show you what we can do. Kidamaru pleaded. Saru Sarutobi shook his head. Even if you are a bit above average, I am afraid that is still not reason enough for me to spare you. We know all of Orochimaru's secrets. Taiyuya shouted. We know where all the secret bases and research labs are. Spare us and we'll give you everything. Taiyuya. Jirobo was shocked. You would betray Lord Orochimaru? Fuck Orochimaru. It's because of him we're in this fucking mess. Besides he's dead, we don't owe him a fucking thing anymore. She's right, Sakan agreed. It's time to forget Orochimaru and save ourselves. He looked directly at the Hokage. As his bodyguard we went everywhere with Orochimaru. We can tell you where every last hidden base is, show you if you want. We'll give you everything, all we ask is that you allow us to serve you. We were loyal to Orochimaru-sama until his death, Kadamaru said. Spare us and we will be equally loyal to you. The Hokage put the pipe back in his mouth and took several drawn-out puffs as he again seemed to consider it. Very well, Saratobi said. Provided you tell us everything you know of Orochimaru's operations, and lead us to these bases, I will accept you as genin of this village. You expect us to be fucking genin? Taiyuya asked. Shut up Taiyuya. Sakan snapped. Lord Hokage, your offer is a generous one and we gladly accept. Jiraiya placed tacking seals on each of their backs. They were then taken to individual interrogation sessions. They provided a wealth of information. Late that evening Sarutobi and Jiraiya were in his office looking at some of the information they had gained. Sarutobi shook his head wearily. I had no idea his operations were so vast. He had bases in almost every country. What will you do? Send strike teams to liberate the camps and destroy the bases. Those four will act as guides for our people. Jiraiya gave the man an admiring look. You know old man, when you retire you ought to become a director. That little scene could not have played out better if you'd given them all scripts. They knew they, knew they really did face execution. And it is always much better to let the prisoners think they are volunteering information rather than being forced to give it up. When they believe it is their own idea, they tend to be eager to reveal all. When they know they are being forced the tendency is to give as little as possible. Sarutobi paused. None of them knew who Orochimaru summoned. Jiraiya nodded. That's a relief. Sarutobi nodded. You and I are the only ones who know the truth. I think it would be for the best that it remains that way. Jiraiya nodded. I don't like taking credit for something I didn't do, but I agree. I can just imagine what it would do to people if they heard the Yandame had been brought back. There is also another very important matter I wanted to discuss with you. Sarutobi said. What's that? I've been thinking about my retirement and who should succeed me. There was a pounding on his front door. Naruto slowly opened his eyes and focused. There was light pouring through his bedroom window. Glancing at his alarm clock at red 10.37. He sat up in bed and stretched and let out a long yawn. He never slept in late, he was always up early ready to do things. 
he really must have been wiped out from yesterday's events. He was remembering that Kakashi-sensei had actually carried him home. He also remembered throwing his jumpsuit into the garbage. He would never get all that blood out. Fortunately, he had three more exactly like it. He had managed to take a hot shower and then crashed into his bed. The pounding continued from the door without let up. I'm coming already, hold on. He tossed aside his blankets and got up out of bed. He walked past the piles of clothes and discarded cups of instant ramen that littered the floor. He had on a pair of cheery orange boxers and a t-shirt that had future Hokage printed on it. He stumbled to the door and opened it. Naruto Kuen. A happy and relieved shout greeted him. Before he could even respond the girl leapt onto his chest and glomped on. He was knocked to the floor with a teary-eyed Hinata pressing herself against him. Hi. Hinata? Hinata what's wrong? Why are you crying? She looked up at him smiling and quickly wiped away her tears. Oh, I'm sorry, ninja aren't supposed to cry I know. It's just that I was so worried about you. I wanted to come see you but I was ordered to go directly home when I was finally relieved. I tried calling you but all the phone lines are out. I couldn't stand not knowing if you were alright. I finally got permission to leave the estates and I came here as fast as I could. He looked at the girl and felt his heart thudding in his chest. You cried for me? He said in a small voice. She nodded, feeling embarrassed at showing such weakness in front of him. She was taken by surprise as his arm suddenly wrapped around her and pulled her down tight. Thank you, he whispered in her ear, his voice threatening to crack. In his whole miserable life, the only other person to have shed tears for him had been Irika. For that, he would always love Irika. And now he knew that he would always love Hinata as well. Chapter 17, A Green Vest Hinata didn't understand why Naruto held her so tight for so long. Or why he seemed on the verge of tears. It was enough for her that she was in his arms. She just shut her eyes and enjoyed the feeling of being with Naruto Kuen. Sasuke opened his eyes to find himself in an unfamiliar room. Sasuke Kuen. Sakura was suddenly hugging him. You're finally awake. He didn't like being touched, and he especially didn't like being mauled. Sakura let go of me. His words were chilly. She immediately did as he asked and stood back. The cold look in his eyes hurt her. I only wanted him to know I was glad he was all right. He looked about and quickly recognized where he was. Why am I in the hospi hospital? Something happened to your curse seal and you passed out. Eno and I got you here as fast as we could. He gave her an odd look. The two of you didn't take advantage of me while I was unconscious, did you? What? He shook his head. Never mind. I can't believe you would even think that. Flashback. They were going over the rooftops headed towards the hospital. Eno suddenly signaled for a stop. They carefully put Sasuke down on a roof. What are you doing? Sakura demanded. We have to get Sasuke Kuen to the hospital. Relax forehead, his pulse and heartbeat are both strong. He's just unconscious. Eno suddenly had a wicked grin. Do you want to kiss him? Sakura immediately turned red. Inside her inner Sakura gave an immediate reply. Hell yes. What's the matter with you Eno pig? You can't kiss him like that, it would be wrong. But forehead, you know what he's like. He might never kiss anyone. Or it might be twenty years after he's killed Itachi and is ready to rebuild his clan. No way am I waiting twenty years to kiss that boy. Let me at him. Inner Sakura began making smooching sounds. I'm sure he'll kiss me when he's ready. Ino frowned. And just what makes you think he'll end up kissing your forehead girl? Sakura crossed her arms and tried to sound smug. Who else would he kiss? 
How about someone who is actually pretty and doesn't have a monstrous forehead? Like, oh I don't know, me? Sakura barked a laugh. Like that will ever happen. Now come on, let's get him to the hospital. Shrugging Ino slung one arm over her shoulders while Sakura got the other. They were soon headed towards the hospital again. Meanwhile inner Sakura was shouting. No! 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 Just knock Ino out and then we can ravish Sasuke. I should have listened, she mumbled to herself. What was that? Sasuke asked. Nothing. Nothing at all. You're act acting weirder than usual Sakura. He tossed aside his blankets and jumped out of bed. He was wearing a hospital gown but he could see his clothes had been neatly folded and placed on a chair. I'm getting dressed and getting out of here. I don't think you're supposed to do that until a doctor release you. Sakura said. I'm fine, and besides I'm not taking up a room when there are real wounded people here. He picked up his dark blue shirt, and was about to take off the hospital gown when he saw Sakura still standing there. Do you mind? Oh, right, well since you're feeling better, I suppose I'll go. By the way, Kakashi-sensei stopped by earlier. All the genin teams are being ordered to meet at the tower at noon. He nodded. I'll be there. All right. I guess I'll go let Naruto know. When Naruto finally let go of her and they both stood up, they both began to feel embarrassed. Hinata only now realized just how little Naruto was wearing and her face immediately turned red. What Naruto suddenly realized was what a mess his apartment was. There were clothes and empty ramen cups everywhere, dirty dishes were stacked in the sink, and the bathroom, he really didn't want to think about the bathroom. He normally never even noticed the condition of his apartment. But having Hinata here changed all that. Grinning he rubbed the back of his head nervously. Ah, sorry about the mess, I wasn't expecting anyone. Blushing she looked down and began to press her index fingers together. Oh, it's all right Naruto-kun. Hinata-chan, could you maybe wait outside and give me just five minutes to get dressed and clean up a little? If I came at a bad time Naruto-ku and I can just... No, he quickly reached out and took hold of her hands. I am very, very ha happy that you came Hinata-chan. I want you to stay, but I just need five minutes. Please? Her face was as red as a tomato. He wanted her to stay. She couldn't get any words out so she nodded her head and stepped outside. As soon as the door was shut, he ran through some hand signs and created 20 clones. You guys know what to do. He bolted for the bathroom and a speedy shower. The clones meanwhile broke out the cleaning supplies and got busy picking things up and cleaning. The garbage was already overflowing and the clones soon had two more bags stuffed. The laundry hamper was also hidden beneath a small mountain of clothes. The bed got made, the dishes got washed and put away, he even had his little vacuum cleaner start early on its annual cleaning run. As soon as he exited the bathroom three brave clones went in to do what they could. The full garbage bags went out the bedroom window and straight down to a waiting dumpster. Clones dusted and quickly had the air filled with dust. One clone ran about with an air freshener desperately trying to cover up the overpowering odor of sweat and ramen. By the time the original had a clean, well relatively clean, orange jumpsuit on the apartment actually looked livable. Except for the bathroom, the brave clones had done what they could, but there were limits. He shut the door and prayed Hinata didn't have to use it. After the promised five minutes he opened the apartment door and welcomed an amused-looking Hinata back inside. He gave her a twenty-second tour of his apartment. He wanted to make something for them to eat but had to confess that all he had was tea and instant ramen. Hinata then surprised him. Give me one second. She told him. Before he could argue she went out the door. Just a few seconds later she came back in holding a cake under a little plastic cover. He had, he had a huge smile on his face. Hinata-chan, you brought cake. She set the cake down on his little table, 
and then surprised him again by shaking her head. It's not from me, Naruto Kuon. He looked at her blankly. Who's it from then? Giggling, she headed towards the door again. Come on and see for yourself. Stepping outside his apartment, he was surprised to find a small pile of items on either side of his door. There were flowers and cards, dozens of them. There were a couple more cakes and a few paper plates with cookies under plastic wrap. Hinata-chan, what is all this? She had a huge smile. These are gifts Naruto-kun, gifts from the people of Kanoha. They're thanking you for what you did yesterday. Naruto looked at all the flowers, cards, and baked goods. These are for me? He said in a small voice. He literally had trouble believing it. Part of him wanted to start dancing and shouting. But a bigger part was nervous, he half expected some sort of trick. When he was little, he'd learned the hard way why you should never take candy from strangers. Fortunately, his healing ability seemed to make him immune to poison. Is something wrong naruto Kuan? She'd been expecting a much bigger reaction. Instead, he was just standing there looking at all the gifts. Oh, nothing. I'm just sort of amazed, I guess. I'm not used to gifts. Well, you deserve them naruto Kuan. She said happily. We should bring them inside. He nodded weakly. Right. While he made some tea Hinata got out some newly cleaned plates and a kitchen knife. She quickly had the cake sliced up and a large piece sitting on each plate. Naruto was a little nervous about eating food that had been left outside his door. Once the tea was ready, he brought the cake up to his nose and actually sniffed it. He had a strong sense of smell, though it was nowhere near an Inazuka's. Well, I think it's all right. He said as he sat down and grabbed a fork. Well, of course it is Naruto Kuon. Hinata smiled playfully. Do you think someone would poison it? Since she began eating, she obviously had no doubts. Naruto knew better than to think everyone who lived in the village was so benign. But he didn't share his doubts, there was no reason to upset her. He took a bite. Mmm, lemon cake, it's pretty good. I prefer chocolate, but this is really good. As they ate, she looked over to him. Naruto Kuen, when was the last time you had a home cooked meal? Oh, I eat at home all the time, Hinata chan. So, you know how to cook? He shook his head. Not really, but I can boil water and put things in the microwave. She didn't like the sound of that. Well, when was the last time you had an actual meal? He thought about it. Well, hmm, I guess never. I mean I've had Irika and the old man treat me to some good meals, but those are always out. So, you have never had a home-cooked meal? He thought about it some more. Well, I guess when I was still living in the orphanage you could count those meals. She shook her head. Naruto Kuen, the next time we are together I am making you a nice dinner. Hinata-chan, Naruto said in surprise. You don't need to go to the trouble. It's no trouble Naruto Kuen, it would make me very happy to cook for you. As they, they slowly relaxed and ate, they talked about the events of the past 24 hours. Naruto got to tell her how amazing she had been in defeating Temari. He told her about all the various fights and evacuations he and his clones had taken part in. He was careful to leave out some of the gorier details. Though he was still not the most observant guy in the world when it came to women, he did pick up on the look of hero worship in her eyes. It was a bit embarrassing to him, but kind of nice. She told him about her own less grueling experience. She didn't think it compared in any way to what he had done, but Naruto wanted to hear about it. So, she had told him about helping people to reach the shelters and then guarding one of the entrances with Shino. She told him of her relief at hearing that Kiba and his group had all made it back. She also told him that Sasuke had gone to the hospital after passing out, but was all right. He passed out? Naruto chuckled with glee. Oh, the team's never living that one down. He was going to get more details when there was a knock at the door. 
Wow, two visitors in one day. I must be getting popular. As he got up from the table, he noticed the time was 11.35. Had it already been an hour? It felt more like 10 minutes, time with Hinata just seemed to fly by. He opened the door to see his pink-haired teammate standing there. Oh, hey Sakura-chan, what are you doing here? She had never been to his home before. Hey Naruto, I came over to let you know we have a meeting at Tower at 12. We should. She suddenly cut off as she saw Hinata come up to the door. Hinata? She looked at the two of them. Were you two on a date? Not really, Naruto informed her. Hinata came over because she was worried about me and we've just been hanging out. Naruto turned to smile at his girlfriend and Sakura could see Hinata blush slightly. But unlike times past she didn't seem so shy anymore. That's right, Hinata confirmed. I was worried about Naruto-kun so I came over to make sure he was alright. Isn't she great? Naruto said proudly. Sakura nodded. I'm glad you appreciate the fact that she cares about you. Ju. He looked at her in surprise. Of course, I do Sakura-chan. Only a total heartless team wouldn't appreciate a girl being worried about him. Heh, she laughed weakly. Right, come on let's go. Hinata the meeting is for all the genin squads so you may as well come along too. As they left the apartment Naruto took Hinata's hand gently into his. They walked the whole way there hand in hand. Along the way Naruto noticed something. People would look at him and, and, smile. At first, he thought they were smiling at Hinata. But before long it became pretty clear that they were smiling at him. Oh, the smiles didn't come from everyone. Plenty of people, especially the older ones, still sent him dark looks. But for the first time that he could remember, he got more positive looks from people than he did harsh ones. And as he walked along with his girlfriend and his teammate, he slowly began to smile back at people. Sakura walked a little bit behind, as tended to be her habit. She noticed the improved reaction Naruto was getting, and was glad. Even if Naruto could be loud, annoying, and dumb, she was the first to admit he was a good person. But while she noticed the way strangers were looking at him, what she noticed most was the way he and Hinata were behaving. They were just walking along hand in hand without a care in the world. They didn't seem to be talking much, but they didn't seem to really need to. They were just happy to be together and comfortable, comfortable around one another. They really look like a couple. Sakura thought. It suddenly struck her that they'd been together for a full month now. That was long enough to be considered an official couple. Looking at them she felt an ache in her chest. It occurred to her that Hinata had exactly what she had always wanted. Hinata had a devoted boyfriend who really appreciated her and was happy to spend time together. And it was obvious just from looking at her that Hinata was completely happy with her boyfriend. It's not fair. Sakura wailed inside. Why can't I have that with Sasuke? She was surprised when her thoughts provoked an answer. Simple, because Sasuke isn't Naruto. Inner Sakura informed her. She nodded to herself. Well of course he wasn't, Sasuke was way better than Naruto, right? And for maybe for the very first time, she suddenly found herself wondering why exactly was Sasuke better. She had never wondered about that before. She had just always accepted it as a fact. She had liked him ever since the first time she'd ever seen him. Way back when we were just starting at the academy. Her inner self reminded her. Yes, that's right. She could still remember seeing him back then. He had been so cute, with just the warmest most adorable smile. Yes, that was back when he still smiled. We haven't seen that smile in a very long time. That was very true. Sasuke had stopped smiling and become withdrawn and brooding, he had become cool. All the girls equated his constant silence to being deep. It was just proof that he was better than all the other loud childish boys. That's what we thought, 
but what if we were wrong? What if it was just proof that he didn't want to talk to anyone? She didn't like the direction that thought was taking. Hey! Don't think bad things about Sasuke-kun. Why not? Inner Sakura asked. Has Sasuke become a kami where we can't event think anything negative about him? Just whose side are you on? I'm on the side that wants to stop feeling, feeling lonely and miserable all the time. I'm on the side that wants to stop feeling pathetic and worthless every time Sasuke ignores us. She flinched a little at her own thoughts. They were true, she wasn't happy. But she had always assumed she wasn't happy because she didn't have Sasuke. She was certain that once she finally won him over, she would be deliriously happy. But, but what if she wasn't? What if the problem wasn't being without Sasuke? What if the whole problem was trying to be with Sasuke to begin with? I have an idea. Inner Sakura announced. We're really smart, right? Cha. Top grades in the academy. She thought proudly. Well then, why don't we treat this like a problem on an exam and use logic to figure it out? The question is, what does Haruno Sakura really want in a boyfriend? All right. He should be kind. Right, she agreed with herself. He should be honest. Right. He should be dependable. Right. He should pay attention to us. Right. He should always be happy to see us. Right. He should be able to tell us how he feels and share his feelings. Right. He should treat us the way Naruto treats Hinata. Right. He should be like Naruto. Right. Ha, ha, ha. Hey. No fair. You tricked me. Whatever, you know it's the truth. Hey Sakura-chan, are you okay? What? Naruto and Hinata were both looking at her oddly. Are you okay? Naruto repeated. Of course, why do you ask? Because we're here and you were about to keep walking past. Oh, heh, I guess I was daydreaming. Let's go find Kakashi-sensei. Kakashi, Asuma, Karinai, their teams and Niji and Tenten were escorted into the Hokage's office. Naruto immediately jumped up and pointed at the man standing next to the Hokage. Hokage. Hey! What is that pedophile doing here? Pedophile? Kakashi asked. Jiraiya smacked his forehead with his hand. Kid! Don't call me that! Well, you're the one who was wanting to touch my stomach you big perv. Naruto yelled at him. All eyes turned to the Sanin. Why exactly were you wanting to touch Naruto's stomach? Karinai asked with some alarm. It was no secret that Jiraiya was a pervert, but until now she'd never thought his perversion ran in that direction. You should be aware Jiraiya-sama that molesting a child is a crime in this village. It wasn't like that. Jiraiya shouted. I was removing a seal Orochimaru had put on his belly. I happen to be a super pervert, not a pedophile. He quickly reached into a pouch and pulled out an orange-clad book. Only a true pervert could write something like this. He said proudly. Needless to say, every member of Team 7 immediately recognized the book. Nanny? You write that smut? Sakura said in disgust. It's adult-themed literature young lady, Jiraiya said smugly. Naruto shook his head. Fine then I'll just call you a pervert instead. Kid, Jiraiya said. I've told you before, I'm the one and only Jiraiya, the legendary toad sage. Fine then, an annoyed Naruto announced. Your name is Erosenin. Wait a second. Sasuke called out. You're Jiraiya? The legendary Sanin? With a smug smile he nodded. I sure am, I'm glad at least some of you kids have heard of me. Sasuke looked up at him blankly. I don't think I've ever been so disappointed in my whole life. What? 
Saratobi let out an annoyed cough. I think I should inform you of the reason I have brought you all here. He looked at the genin and smiled. I am here to announce promotions to the rank of Chunin. Promotions? Naruto looked confused. But the finals got interrupted, doesn't that mean no one can be promoted? Ni Niji looked over to him. You really are an idiot, aren't you? What did you say jerk? Naruto turned angrily towards the cool boy. No more than three of four chunin are ever promoted at each of the exams. That means there are only six to eight new chunin for all the participating villages. We have about 50 jonin and maybe 300 chunin in this village alone. Given that there's no way that all the chunin could come from the exams alone. Niji explained smoothly, not even deigning to notice Naruto's anger or Hinata's unhappy look. He did notice when Ten Ten touched his arm and gave him a small frown. Niji is right, Kakashi said. Even if he has his own way of informing you Naruto. The Kage of every village has the right to promote whoever he sees fit at any time. Naruto turned to the Hokage. But what about that whole speech you gave us about friendship between the villages and maintaining balance and all that? That was all true Naruto, the exams do foster friendship among the villages and help maintain a balance. A balance of the elite of each village, which is what is on display. To be promoted through the exams is considered the highest honor and achievement. However, as a practical matter the village needs a certain number of jonin and chunin available to handle all assignments. As needed, I promote worthy jenin to the rank of chunin and offer qualified chunin the opportunity to take the jonin exam. And today it is my great pleasure to give six of you promotion. From behind his desk, he pulled out a familiar green flak jacket like the ones Kakashi and Guy wore. Saratobi came out from his desk and stood in front of Naruto holding the vest out to him. This one is yours Naruto. I hereby promote you to the rank of Chunin. Saratobi gave him a pleased smile. Congratulations, I am proud of you. His hands trembled as he reached out and took the vest from the Hokage. It was real. Thank you old man. Yahoo! He shouted happily and broke into the famous Naruto victory dance right there in front of them. Hinata laughed happily as did Kiba, Shikamaru, and most of the others present. Sakura loudly cheered him on, really happy for him. Kakashi applauded. Applauded. Sasuke smirked, but didn't hold Naruto's display of happiness against him. Niji found the display embarrassing and just shook his head. Jiraiya took out his notebook and began scribbling. This would make a good scene. The Hokage had five more vests to hand out. Congratulations Hinata-chan! Naruto gave her a huge hug and started dancing all over again. He seemed almost as happy at her promotion as he'd been with his own. Way to go Hinata! Kiba said happily. Your promotion is both well-deserved and most appropriate. It provides me with deep emotional satisfaction to witness your exquisite triumph. Shino then gently patted her shoulder in a display of raw unbridled emotion. I am very proud of you Hinata. Karina said and gave her a hug of her own. Congratulations Lady Hinata, Niji said with a stiff and proper bow. He would have been amazed if the main branch Hyuga had not been promoted. Hinata was not the only one on her team to be promoted. For heroic service on the battlefield including five confirmed kills I am pleased to promote you Kiba. Saratobi gave him a vest. All right. Kiba shouted as Akamaru barked and people congratulated him. Man, I can already tell this is going to be really troublesome. Baka. Ino yelled at her lazy teammate. You just got promoted you should be happy. Shikamaru rolled his eyes. Yeah right, all this means is more work. Asuma could only laugh at his favorite student's attitude. Come on, when we get done here we're getting barbecue, my treat. Oh yeah. Chuji shouted, more excited by far than the one who actually got promoted.
Niji accepted the honor with quiet dignified thanks, as was proper for a real ninja. He acknowledged Hinata's congratulations and appreciated those from Ten Ten. The others he accepted without comment. Comment. Well at least I've finally gotten some recognition. Still, he couldn't help but look at Naruto and Hinata. The fact that those two weaklings had also been promoted left a little sour taste. I don't care if we are all tuned in now. I will show the world that you are both inferior to me. When Ten Ten received hers Niji's praise was quiet but sincere. Hey Niji, why don't we go on that date tonight? We can celebrate our promotions. Niji nodded his agreement. I think that would be a fine way to celebrate. Great. I've heard about this wonderful place called Cafe Maruki where the first meal for a new couple is free. Sasuke said nothing once the vests were all handed out. Of course, he'd known he wasn't getting promoted. He was definitely good enough to be if the dobe was. The problem was he hadn't gotten the chance to show what he could do. The exams had been interrupted and then Kakashi had denied him his chance to prove what he could do in real-life combat. Of the six vests given out five were battlefield promotions. If Kakashi had only trusted him it would have been six. So, what happens now? Sasuke asked his sensei. Kakashi smiled beneath his mask. We go back to training and performing missions of course. That's not good enough. Sasuke informed him. Kakashi's smile slipped. He could see the anger and frustration building and was afraid that an explosion was imminent. What do you mean Sasuke? I mean exactly what I said. It's not good enough. Sasuke shouted at him. All the talk and celebration suddenly ground to a halt and all eyes focused on him. Kakashi looked about, this was the worst possible time and place for this. Sasuke why don't we talk about this later? No. No, the boy replied adamantly. You spent a whole month training me, and for what? To dump me and take the dobe with you instead. If you had just trusted me, I'd be Chunin now. Kakashi was a very easygoing soul, and he was aware of the things Sasuke had suffered. As such he had gone a very long way to try and keep the young man happy, but there were limits. There were certain lines that were not to be crossed, ever. One of those was calling out your sensei in front of others, especially the Hokage. Kakashi suddenly snapped the book in his hand shut and put it away. Anyone who knew Kakashi knew that was a sign that he was taking things seriously. There were reasons for my decision Sasuke, and I stand by them. His tone was no longer light-hearted, he sounded very serious. Like what? To put it bluntly Sasuke, I was afraid you would take foolish risks simply to build a reputation. And given your current behavior I can see my decision was right. Oh yeah? Then why did you take the dobe with you? Because by the time I assigned different missions Naruto had already killed. It was obvious to me that unlike you Sasuke he understood that a battle is no place to go looking for unnecessary risks. I trusted him to follow my orders and not take foolish chances. But you didn't trust me? Sasuke asked. That's right, Kakashi answered. If Sasuke was determined to get some blunt answers then he would. Naruto has his share of faults, but thinking he is more important than everyone else isn't one of them. Since we've become a team Sasuke you've obsessed more and more on acquiring power for the sake of your own revenge. That is a dangerous and very poor motivation. You're like a dog with the hold of a bone who won't let go even when he sees wolves coming, you'd sooner die than give up your hold. I need power. Sasuke demanded. So that you can go out and kill Itachi? Yes. I need you to help me become powerful enough to kill him. I am an Avenger, that is my purpose. An Avenger is not a ninja. Sarutobi said quietly drawing the angry boy's atten attention. We ninja kill, but we do so in order to protect and serve this village. 
Is killing your brother more important to you than that? Sasuke did not hesitate. Yes, it's more important to me than anything else. Itachi has to die for what he did. Rest assured, Itachi will be dealt with either by you or by someone else. The thought that someone else might kill his brother filled him with fresh rage. No. I'm the only one who can kill him. That is not your decision to make Sasuke. It is the Hokage who decides who will perform which mission. I have a right. Enough Sasuke. A rare flash of Saratobi's anger silenced the boy. I know how much you have suffered and a great many accommodations have been made for you. But you will not dictate to me or your sensei what you will be taught or what mission you will be assigned. Whatever else you may be Sasuke, so long as you wear the Hitayite you are a ninja of Kanahagakure. I expect that to come before all else. I believe you have spent far too much time thinking about your rights. I suggest you give some thought to your responsibilities. He shook his head and suddenly felt very old. Very well, Saratobi announced. I think we are done here. You newly promoted Chunin will receive your new assignments as will your former teams. I beg pardon, Hokage-sama. Sakura spoke up timidly. But what do you mean former teams? What he means if that the Dobe and the others are going on to bigger and better things. Sasuke answered feeling wounded and more than a little bitter. Naruto is not a part of Team 7 anymore. Sakura looked worriedly to Kakashi. Is this true sensei? As weird as it seemed she didn't want to lose Naruto. Without her ever realizing it he had become her support, he had cheered her up through the worst of times. She didn't know how she would manage without his bright smile to lighten her day. To her sorrow Kakashi was nodding. It is, though it's nothing to be upset about Sakura. Kakashi answered. As a chunin Naruto will be expected to act as a mission leader and will also be given individual assignments. We on the other hand will continue to train and go on missions for the village. As a matter of fact, we will no longer be designated Team 7, from now on we will be Team Kakashi. He tried to sound encouraging. You should also know that at some point we'll receive a new member to take Naruto's spot. So, we really are losing him. She turned to look at Naruto. It's okay Sakura-chan, I'll still be around. Naruto tried to reassure her. That's true Sakura, Kakashi said. We'll still see each other, it just won't be on a regular basis anymore. We may even get to work together again. Speaking of which, he looked at Naruto. I still plan on teaching you that jutsu I mentioned. We'll need to find time when we can meet and work together. Really? Naruto said excitedly. Even if he was now a chunin that didn't mean he still didn't want Kakashi to train him. That's great, what's this jutsu called? It's called Raisingan, and it's a jutsu my sensei the fourth Hokage invented. Actually Kakashi, Jiraiya spoke. Why don't let me teach it to him? After all he is going to be my new apprentice. You're what? Kakashi was truly surprised. Though not as surprised as Naruto. He immediately pointed an accusing finger at the older ninja. I knew it. You just want an excuse to be alone with me. You are a pedophile. Before Jiraiya could explode the Hokage dismissed everyone. Except you Naruto, I want you to come take a walk with me, just you and me. The Hokage wanted to have a very important talk with the young man. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfiction. Looking forward to having you on board again.